you. Further debate? The member for Oshawa. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak today uh, and share a little bit of the proud military history um, in Oshawa and, and our, um, our connected communities. I, I see the member across the way from Whitby, and when we used to share part of Oshawa, we would also uh, share the service clubs and um, many of the occasions that we would come together as community. Um, and I know that we all have stories across our communities, and we've been hearing those today, um, and it is, it's very heartening to know that we all have that in common and that we do continue to appreciate the service and sacrifice um, of so many before us, but also to come together at our legions, at our service clubs, with community members to ensure that we continue to care about and support um, those veterans and families of veterans um, in our community. So. I, I, would be, um, I would be glad to actually tell you, Speaker, that in Oshawa, we have a very proud tradition of Levy Day. And I don't know how many other communities still have Levy Days, um, but we do. And we have, um, we have on January 1st a very special way of ringing in the new year, and that is the morning of January 1st, we travel around and we visit all of the legions and service clubs. And at the, uh, you know, uh, there are a few, a few things, Speaker, that I'll say, and that is what happens in the Navy Club basement stays in the Navy Club basement, um, and that there may or may not be grog, and there, uh, there are memories made, and, and it's a very important time that we come together, and it is to, uh, I guess, count our blessings and um, take stock of, of what we have as a community. Um, and I get nervous, Speaker, because I've been hearing during the pandemic, as I know my colleagues in the legislature have, been hearing from those clubs from the legions, and they're very concerned um, about how they're going to be able to continue beyond the pandemic. They're quite concerned about the support that they haven't, haven't had that they need financially to be able to, um, to keep their doors open, um, to be able to continue to serve and support. Um, in, our, in our neck of the woods, um, we have, I, I was saying it earlier, Speaker, but I will share that in our area, we recognize the contributions of Samuel Simpson Sharp, the manufacturing of the de Havilland Mosquito aircraft. My understanding is, it, I don't know if it was the only, but it was a wooden aircraft. Interesting. Um, super secret Camp X. Any of you who know about Camp X or where to find it, come, come to my neck of the woods. It's not in Oshawa, um, but those stories come from that area, um, and we're proud of that and the Ontars of the Ontario Regiment and the Armoury. The Ontario Regiment Museum, we have the Tank Museum, which is something that is, is growing and brings, brings uh, youth from across the province, actually, who play tank video games and then can come and actually see them in real life in Oshawa. We have active cadet groups, two Royal Canadian Legion branches, 43 and 637. I'm a member of 637. The Polish Veterans Association, the 420 Wing, the Oshawa Naval Veterans Club, and the Canadian Corps Association. And these are, uh, these are the long-standing um, service clubs that serve our city and our neighbors. And this week, just actually this past Friday, the last Friday in, um, the last Friday in October, we kick off Poppy Week in Oshawa. So we raise the flag, we have a week uh, of, or from the 30th leading up to Remembrance Day, we fly the poppy flag in Oshawa. And as we've all been talking about today, we remind each other to buy a new poppy, to wear a poppy. Um, and some of us have been wearing the, the Legion masks or carry new Legion umbrellas or are supporting the Legions online this year um, to ensure that they have the resources that they need but, Speaker, we're here talking about uh, Bill 202, the Soldiers' Aid Commission Act, um, and the, the long and the short of it is that it hasn't been what it is needed to be to serve and support uh, veterans. And as we have heard put, um, you know, it, it hasn't been updated, I think, in, in 60 years, and so the veterans that it purported to serve were those who had served in World War II. Um, and the Korean War, but not since. And we have been talking about the veterans um, who have served subsequent to that who have been left out. Obviously, uh, that's not a partisan issue that we all feel 
we all feel the same need to serve and support. I would like to commend um, the members from St. Catharines and, and from Windsor Tecumseh who have, uh, who have fought long and hard um, and, and worked with their communities and I think with this government on motions um, and bills to further the voices of veterans in this, in this house. Um, and my own work has been, like many of us, meeting with legions, talking with them and hearing from them um, about what it is that they need. And so, Speaker, I wanted to share part of a letter that I have written to this government, um, and I, I'm excited to get that response from the government. I'm hoping that it'll be, um, I'm hoping it's in the mail. Um, but I'll, I'll read part of it. During the uncertain and challenging time of COVID-19, legions have been left to fend for themselves and many will not make it through the pandemic. And considering the essential role of these organizations, it is a travesty that this will be the case when it does not have to be. This government's reannouncement of capital grants will not keep the doors open for the clubs faced with growing bills for operational costs. The federal government's assistance in the form of an interest-free loan, while helpful to some clubs, will not be an option for many who are unable to take on such substantial debt. Only one club in our community has been supported by their landlord through the CECRA. The kindness of strangers cannot be the only strategy to keep veterans supported. Service clubs need direct financial assistance that can help to pay their rent, mortgage, or utility bills without putting them further into debt. They need this assistance. Speaker, um, I'm excited for what the government's response to this will be, because if I'm to take what we've heard today to heart, we all want what's best for our communities, veterans, uh, and service clubs and legions. So. Hopefully, <laughs> I won't just get an answer. Hopefully, we will be able to keep their doors open. And they need that assistance to retroactively take into consideration the last several months uh, that they've been struggling, that they've been fighting to keep their heads above water for the members who count on them. So I hope that this government will provide them with the support that they desperately need and they desperately deserve. So while I've got you and while I have the floor, um, I would also like to share um, some letters from, from a, few of the, uh, a few of the clubs in my community. Craig Brand is um, actually a fellow member of Branch 637 and part of his letter to me earlier in the summer, so this was in July, he said, during the pandemic, I wanted to let you know that our branch may not be around because we cannot open under stage three. I would like to see if the government can help us and the other small legions that may not be around. We as the legion have provided support to our community and to the veterans that live in them. If we close because of this pandemic and are not able to open, I feel the community and the veterans will not be serviced the way that they should. So that was Craig's concern. We continue to have that concern with such an uncertain road ahead. Rick Saunders wrote to me in March um, the subject, financial assistance. Good afternoon, Jennifer. In light of Premier Ford's announcement that they said 300 million is set aside for COVID-19, there's growing pressure to close branch 637. So can you clarify if part of that money would be available for private not-for-profit organizations who shut down during this crisis? Yours in comradeship, Rick Saunders, Zone F1 Commander. Again, so much uncertainty and concern. Um, from the Oshawa Naval Veterans Club, um, and this from uh, Brian Wilkins, the president, regarding service clubs motion at Queen's Park. So this was just earlier in October, and we know that th this is in reference to the, um, to the motion of my, my colleague uh, that passed this legislature, but here were his thoughts. It's going to help a lot to have 50-50 draws and such, not worrying about a permit, but that's not helping with the big picture. We can't rent our hall for more than 50 people, so no bookings are happening. Our customers aren't returning very quickly. Most of the dart leagues are suspended. We can't make the income needed to stay afloat comfortably. This is why the original talk with Jennifer was about getting the loans some received forgiven. It was federal money, but Ontario hasn't done anything for our veterans. Premier Ford needs to take some of the money he's passing around and help us out. All the best. And frankly, I wish them all the best. Um, you know, we get attached to the community spaces in our 
um, in our hometowns. Um, we've heard today about the importance of legions and how they serve veterans in need and their families. On a, on a lighter note, uh, legions really are that um, social net. Um, for me, I love being able to you know, dance and prance from service club to service club on levy day or after Remembrance Day, which is a, a somber and important day, but it's such a special opportunity to visit these uh, community spaces and connect with people you haven't seen in a while, whether it's sitting and having a, a nice dinner and the party afterwards, um, you know, or, or sitting and <laughs> sitting and doing karaoke. Um, and speaker, in case you're wondering, no, there is not video of that, but we, we have, and we haven't had karaoke since the pandemic, of course, because, you know, all, all, of, the, all of the precautions and whatnot, but we, we reflect on uh, what these spaces mean to us and to imagine that they aren't there on a personal level um, is very distressing, but on that community level um, is, really upsetting. Um, speaker, I think that we all uh, are reflecting on, on the pressures of the world around us. And, you know, many of my colleagues in this House have spoken today um, extensively about the pressures faced by veterans when they come back, whether it's with physical harm and physical visible scars, or whether it is the unseen um, burdens that they carry. Um, and if there aren't the supports and services in the community like um, housing or mental health supports, uh, supports for families, um, they're left to go it alone. Um, you know, it was interesting earlier, I've lost track of time speakers, so I feel like it was a, about a year ago, but I'd have to, uh, I'd have to double check. Um, but it was, uh, it was a local initiative and, and the, um, the courthouse was renamed. Um, the courthouse was renamed, and it was an interesting conversation to have. It was renamed um, in, in memory of Samuel Simpson Sharp. And the reason that it was at all controversial was because this is an individual who, despite all of his service and all of his um, community involvement, um, was erased from history because, um, because he died by suicide, and it was at a time that that was, you know, the stigma that went with that and, and um, it resulted in the erasure of, of his legacy. So that was actually a, a nonpartisan that was, you know, uh, my, my conservative colleagues in the surrounding communities uh, and I wrote letters and came together to advocate for the renaming of the courthouse, and it was a, a proud and important day which was part of that broader conversation, um, not only about recognizing service um, and sacrifice, but talking about and recognizing um, the weight and the burden of mental health, of PTSD, um, of shell shock, of whatever we're going to call it, but that unseen burden. Um, and how do we support that? So here we are talking about the Soldiers' Aid Commission um, and ways to improve it. And we, of course, are going to say, as I'm sure that the, my colleagues on the other side are going to say, we, we need to keep doing more and keep doing better because, you know, there, we, we have everything. When we look around this province, we have everything that we could imagine because we live in a free and democratic society and we are able to stand and run for election. We are able to, you know, send our children to school. We are able to do all sorts of wonderful things that might not be imaginable in other countries, and that is because we have built a foundation on that service and sacrifice of so many. And so this is not a time, nor is it ever a time, to nickel and dime the investment um, in their health and well-being. So, you know, I will come back to my letter and my ask um, in a minute. I think I've still got a little bit of time left. And I'm going to use it, Speaker, because it's really important and special for me to be able to share about my community. We have rights and responsibilities. We talk about that all the time in this legislature, but we have a responsibility um, because we have 
those rights. And our responsibility as a legislature is when we identify a need to address it, especially if we're going to talk about veterans. Um, you know, our blessings and freedoms are really being brought into clear focus right now. As we look at other jurisdictions, um, you know, around the world, uh, some that, you know, we share our continent with, as we're, lo as we're looking at other jurisdictions right now, um, we are seeing shifting ideologies. We are seeing shifting, maybe shifting governments. You know, we're, we're, we're not sure what we're seeing, but I think that it's important to recognize the foundation that we have and how fortunate we really are. Um, and what was that service and sacrifice for, right? We have to be able to ref reflect, respect it, and protect it not just appreciate it once a year. And I'm not suggesting that that's what we're doing, any of us in this house, but we do need to um, continue this journey. We have to flex our democratic voices, um, you know, because there are many folks who have fought and died for us. Um, when we look at, at you know, the, the history of, of the Great War, when we look at the history of World War II, and we see that people fought, you know, um, evil powers to ensure that we had democracy, freedom, and rights. We do see a rising tide around the world of neo-Nazism. We see a rising tide of, you know, bigotry and white supremacy, Islamophobia, hate, racism, anti-black racism, sexism. You know, if we're not protecting our, our seniors, our youth, you know, we, we have a lot of work ahead of us, not just as a legislature, but um, as, and I'm speaking broadly, as a society. And we have to honor and value our veterans. And, by, and because of their sacrifice, we do have to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work. Veterans need mental health supports and services. We have talked about that extensively today, but we can look around our own communities and see it every day. We need housing options. And for younger veterans who return from conflict bearing new scars and wounds, be they mental or physical, we need supports and services. We need housing. We need employment supports, potentially retraining. Um, you know, again, mental health supports, and we cannot allow them to shut themselves away. We cannot also shut them away. Everyone who comes back from conflict should be able to reintegrate in society as they are able, and that will be different for everyone um, I remember speaking to a, a gentleman, his name was Rick, a veteran in my community, and he was one of the first appointments that I had. Um, and it wasn't an appointment that I reached out and made, it was an appointment that he reached out to meet with me, and he wanted me to be very clear on PTSD and to understand what that meant. And now this was his, um, his explanation, speaker, but he said it was like he was a teapot. It was like he was a broken teapot that had shattered and been glued back together. That after treatment and, and help, that he was able to put those pieces back together and it could still function, but the cracks were always still there and it would always be more fragile um, and, and need special care. Some of those were my words, but it was his picture and I've always carried it with me, that it still works, it still functions, but it has, um, it has some parts that now make it more unique, you know, and, uh, and speaker, the cracks, they say that's how the light gets in, but we do have to make sure that we help to shine a light on, on ways to support. Um, we don't have to do much, um, much of our own work to figure out what that is. We, we are told by the legions, we are told by mental health supporters, we're told by veterans and families themselves what it is, what it is they need, and that is something that, you know, is not in the bill before us because it's, it, this is one part of it today, but I think broadly, when we're looking at any ministry, whether it be housing um, you know, or, or supporting families, um, we're calling on all of us, I think, to identify ways to make things better. Um, we need safe and funded long-term care, Speaker. When we think of veterans, perhaps we think of seniors, although we've talked about today that it is younger and younger veterans that are coming back from conflict. But still, we're talking about our aging Ontarians, aging, um, aging, or aging Ontarians in the care, we need safe, need safe and funded long-term care. Couples should be able to live together, not be separated. Aging and staying in place, whether that's investing in home care um, or services, we have a lot of important work to do. 
And you know, I am a proud Legion member and an, honor an honorary member of many of the clubs. Um, I'm proud of my family's legacy of service. I'm proud of the work that I do in my community with them and for them. I'm proud. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be Canadian and I'm proud to stand in this house. Um, but we really have the opportunity to shape the future in this room, and we have an obligation to do that. As we are nearing Remembrance Day, we need to remember service clubs, uh, the service and sacrifice, the veterans and service clubs. We cannot forget them, um, and I look forward to working with everyone to ensure that these vital organizations can make it through this challenging time and continue to serve our communities and veterans. Thank you, Speaker.